Jula Batra. I request ma'am on you on the dais, please. Along with the speakers, <laughs> Professor Manjula Batra, former Dean Faculty of Law, Jama Mela Islama Delhi. Along with the speakers, Professor Dr. S. Shanta Kumar, Pro Vice Chancellor, GD Goenka University, and Dean School of Law Gurugram. <laughs> Professor Dr. Purvi Pokhriyal, Dean Faculty of Law, Nirma University, Ahmedabad. <laughs> Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, Dean Law School, Benedict University, Greater Noida. <laughs> and Professor Dr. Bhavani Prasad Panda, former founding chancellor, Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai. I leave the dais to the chair, Professor Manjula Batra, to take forward. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the Vice Chancellor, Professor Rajkumar, for having invited me here, and of course, Professor Sridhar Patnayak, who's been an old friend and a very good uh, you know, colleague at Vivekananda Institute of Professional Studies, where I had gone on deputation as director from the Faculty of Law, Jamia Mila Islamia. Uh, I didn't uh, hear uh, my esteemed teacher, Professor Madhav Menon, I came late because I had to come all the way from New Friends Colony. But uh, I, I would really like to say that he is one teacher of Delhi University Faculty of Law that I can never forget. And he has a vision like other teachers, like Professor Bakshi, like Professor M.P. Singh, the kind which we will not find today anywhere. That is why when we talk about law schools, it is so important to talk about the teachers, the faculty, and how they are imparting the legal education. Uh, people like Professor Madhav Menon have had a vision, okay? And this is so because when I joined Campus Law Center, I was also doing Russian language from Delhi University, and I got a scholarship for Russian language to go to Moscow. I think I was in my second day of the three-year law course, and uh, he had started teaching criminology to me. And I enjoyed his lectures, and I got this scholarship to go to Pushkin Institute. And I went up to him and I said, sir, can I go, but I'll miss my exams. How do I manage? At that time, we had supplementary examination system in Delhi University. And you know what he said? He says, go. This opportunity you will not get again. Go, go, have a good exposure, learn, come back, take the supplementary examination. And I didn't give it a second thought and I went. And I would like to thank him even today because that was the turning point in my life because I also took up law by default and I've achieved a lot in this career today and what I am. I would actually thank my teachers like Professor Madhav Menon, Professor Pendra Bakshi, and MP Singh. Okay, I've heard a little bit about what was said regarding the legal education. Uh, you know, the fight is not between national law schools, five-year law course, and three-year law course. We have to create a knowledge-based society. That is important. Having been at Jamia for over 27 years, and also having taught in Delhi University for two years, having been at Vivekananda, and now I'm Director Research and Advanced Learning with Delhi Metropolitan Education, which is affiliated to Guru Gobind Singh IP University. I have seen a lot. Jamia Mila Islamia has got its own peculiarities. I, when I joined Jamia Faculty of Law, we had a three-year law course. And we had some very good students. At that time, the honorary director was Professor Tahir Mahmood. He really took good students to interview. Gradually, I got a permanent job. I was the first faculty to be taken in, in Jamia. And I built up the curriculum, the faculty, and everything. Then, way back in 2000, we had a vice chancellor by the name of Shahid Mehindi. He wanted to phase out the three-year law course and start a five-year law course after the NLUs had come into existence. Now, it was a big thing for us because after graduation, I was used to teaching, you know, students came after post-graduation, after graduation, and the level of the students was totally different, and you knew that they would understand, you know, it was at a mature level. But when we had a 5 year course which started, 
obviously the first year students had just come fresh from school and they hardly knew anything about law. So it took us some time to come down to their level and I was taking torts, law of torts for many years and, but it was fun, okay, to make law more simple and they enjoyed the subject. Now let us see how we can actually create a knowledge-based society because legal education plays a very important role in bringing about social, economic, political justice in our country, which is there, the ideas are there in the preamble of the Constitution and in the very spirit of constitutionalism, which is there under the Constitution of India. I would not take much time now, as it is we are running late. Now the session uh, will end, I've been told it should end by 1.30. So we have four speakers. Dr. Alka Chavla has not come. I believe she's not too well. Uh, the speakers are Professor Dr. S. Shantakumar, who's a pro-vice chancellor, uh, G.D. Goenka University and Dean School of Law, Gurugram. Then we have Professor Purvi Pokharyal, Dean Faculty of Law, Nirma University, Ahmedabad. Uh, then we have Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, Dean School of Law, Bennett University, Greater Noida and Professor Bhavani Prasad Panda, former founding vice chancellor, Maharashtra National University, Mumbai. I think I will give them uh, the space now and we, uh, we leave some room for discussion after the talks are over. Uh, could I please uh, request Professor Shantakumar to come and deliver his address? Thank you. Respected Professor N. R. Madhav Menon, Professor Venkat Rao, Professor Manjula Batra, Professor Bhavani Panda. And distinguished panelists and wonderful audience before me. I deem it a privilege today to stand and speak before the father of the modern legal education in India, Professor N. R. Madhra Menon. This is the first time I got an opportunity to stand before you, sir. And, uh, I have a unique experience of uh, working for different kinds of law schools. I started my career with uh, the Government Law College, Chennai. which was part of the Madras University then. Thereafter, I, on transfer, I went to Government Law College, Madurai, a relatively a smaller city. I was teaching at Government Law College. From Madurai, I moved on to the National Law University at Raipur, a very young national law school where I had a wonderful opportunity of establishing the law school along with my vice chancellor and uh, other distinguished colleagues there. And thereafter, I moved to certain private universities and helped them establish the School of Law. Currently, <coughs> I have graduated after being a dean for almost 10 years. Now, I have recently assumed the role of the Pro Vice Chancellor of GD Goenka University at Gurugram, Haryana. This is my journey. And uh, with this experience that what I have gained over a period of 27 years as a law teacher, and apart from that, uh, almost uh, seven years as student of law, and uh, almost five years as researcher of law. So it's an amazing journey. And with this experience, I. I'm here to share my views on this particular theme of the conference that what ails the Indian legal education today. Today we have uh, different kinds of universities offering different quality of legal education. Hope all of you agree with me. There are uh, specialized law schools. We call in India the national law schools where their primary focus is to teach 
law. And then there are uh, government universities, conventional universities like uh, the Delhi University, Madras University, Mumbai University, which has specialized faculties of law. And there are uh, private universities like Jindal, GD Goenka, and SRM, and all this kind of, Nirma is there, Bennett is here. So private universities which are coming up with a vision to provide highest quality of legal education possible. And then we have uh, affiliated colleges, both government and private, which is the largest segment, I think, which is not represented today in this conference. I must appreciate the organizers for very carefully picking up delegates representing all of these institutions. When you look at a law school, what we look at, what we need to look at, I think there are uh, seven important things that what uh, NAC calls it as the criteria. One is the curriculum. Second is how the teaching learning happens there. Number three, what kind of research happens in that institution? Number four, whether they have a good infrastructure to support all these things, teaching, learning, research. Number five, what kind of student they attract? How are the student progressing from that institution? That's number five. Number six, which for me, I will rank it as number one, is the leadership, the management, the governance structure of these institutions, especially the law schools. And number seven is the institutional values and the good, good practices, what they follow. Without any hesitation, they should feel free to copy the best practices from other institutions. What is best at NLS Bangalore? We should not feel shy in copying it if it is very good for the student community, of course, with acknowledgement that this is something which we want to, which we are practicing. Why we are practicing? This is because the best universities in the country are practicing it. These are the seven things that one should look into to see whether a law school is doing justice to legal education. What kind of a curriculum? As of, I, I, I would like to refresh your memory about what Professor Rao was speaking today morning about the kind of curriculum the law schools must have. Is it enough that we teach them law of thought and contract and leave it them there? Or should we teach them what is currently in like cyber law, like the uh, arbitration law? Or do we need to be futuristic in looking at what kind of subjects will be in demand down the line, five years down the line when you will graduate, so that you are prepared for the society? Otherwise, five years down the line when you graduate, things will be completely different, what the society will expect from you. And at that particular point of time, you will feel yourself redundant with no knowledge or no capability to handle those newer things. Is it not the law school's responsibility to look into the future? We can't ask the students to look into the future, but it is the law school leadership which should look into the future and see that what is required down the line in a decade, what is the subject which is going to provide the employability opportunity for the kids at the law school. So that is why you just look at the curriculum, the way teaching learning happens, the way research happens, ultimately things comes down to one particular thing, leadership. Leadership in law school plays a pivotal role Today, NLUs have become NLUs just because of one good leader whom we are very fortunate to have him amongst us. Professor Menon was, he
he proved to be a great leader a great visionary he set up a role model at a particular point of time when this concept itself was not existing it was very difficult to create a new path which he did successfully and now we know that every state would want to have a national law school and whenever a new state wants to come out with a new national law university the first thing they do is they send their bureaucrats and their professors to nls bangalore to study their case study and then learn from their experiences and come back create an act and then start this work so that way nls has shown the path but in spite of that why is that out of these many national law universities very few are really worthy of being called an nlus again it depends on the leadership it depends on the leader you know that you know few nlus are where students are sitting on the streets i'm i'm really worried that uh, as a, uh, a stakeholder in this legal education i'm really concerned about what is happening the kind of leadership crisis the nlus go through you find slowly these nlus are being handed over to retired judges which is a very sad state of affair i do not know how my other panelists will agree with me but then slowly these academic institutions are hand, getting handed over to the retired judiciary this is something which we need to worry about the second uh, concern is however uh, the law school leader has a bright vision with respect to what the law school should do or ought to do you need the support of management today we we are talking about public institutions a recent report published by the association of indian universities say that 90% of the government grants given to public universities which only caters to 6% of the student population please do a research on this you can very well write a paper on it this is the exact statistics what i am telling you 90% of the government grant given to the universities through ugc caters hardly 6% of the student population what about the remaining 94% and this taxpayers money goes to just hardly 6% of the population student population 94% of the population they study on their, their own expenditure their education is not supported by public funds this is something which is again something which we need to think about the next concern is that i would since since majority of the stakeholders today the law schools the law students come out from private law schools i think it's it's high time that instead of calling the professors law professors and law deans and talking about the uh, importance of quality in legal education we should have a conference of the law school owners the management i'm just concluding this yes yeah thank you sir so the the management of these private institutions they need to be called they need to be told how a law school shall function ultimately whatever vision that i had i was very fortunate that wherever i had been i had wonderful management which supported me in establishing a good law school today we are a good law school just because of the support that i could get from my management but then when i speak to my other colleagues the kind of problems they face it's very difficult so it's it's the management which needs to be sensitized which needs to be told that what are the objectives of the law school legal education and how the legal education should be an outcome based education in fact Uh, uh, professor Ma madam menon uh, while replying to a question he said that this is high time that we should have an indian council for legal research to support research we do have this kind of councils for other disciplines but we do not have one for legal education our regulators need to be told the bar councils members 
who regulate the entire legal education, they need to be educated on how a law school shall be. We do not have a, an accrediting body like uh, the engineering school has, like the NBA, which sets the standards of how a curriculum should be. Our teachers are not trained. We don't have a formal mechanism to train our teachers before sending them to the law schools to teach. Our teachers are not trained. In fact, they just passed out, pass out from the law school with an LLM, and then uh, they crack this net examination, and then they are a qualified law teacher. Teaching is taken for granted in this country. This is a skill-oriented profession. Unless and until you possess the skill to be a great teacher, you will never be able to deliver however sound knowledge of law that you might possess. So that skill need to be imparted. I know Professor Madhav Menon had tried multiple times to set up a national law teacher academy, which will regularly train in-service teachers and then the young uh, 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 postgraduates of law who wish to get into teaching. But I think it has not reached the right years. These are some of the things that I wanted to place before you, and it is for all of you to ponder over these things. And once again, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Shantukumar, for your enlightening talk. Uh, we just like to put in a sentence here and there that you were very, very right when you said that we should have a good leader because, uh, you know, when judges take over a law school, they don't have the vision of, of an academician. And there is a lot of, uh, you know, conflict then between teachers and how they have to move about. So that is very important. Another area which you talked about was research. It really needs attention because uh, where I'm working now, I'm director research. And I've seen that the faculty, except for one or two, can't write. I've been correcting articles four times, five times, seven times to at least, you know, come up to a certain average level. So that has to be inculcated if we really want law schools to do well in teaching and research. Uh, I request Professor Purvi Pukriya, Dean, Faculty of Law, Nirma University, Ahmedabad, to please come and give an address. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends. At the outset, uh, my hearty congratulations to Jindal Global Law University for completion of 10 years of his existence. I still remember in the year 2008, 2009, when the deliberations were taking place about establishing a global law universities and law schools specifically in Indian Habitat Center, New Delhi. I was a part of the, some of the deliberations and people were very apprehensive, let me tell you very candidly. But that's the, the stewardship and the leadership of Professor Rajkumar you know, who has shown the world the exemplary institutions in this part of the country. Uh, friends, uh, I'm going to speak on the topic which is given today, a role of law school in knowledge-based society. A lot of things can be said when it comes to the role of law school. So first I would like to focus on knowledge-based society. What is our understanding? How do we perceive a knowledge-based society? If you look at this, yeah. So if you look at this, uh, the whole concept of knowledge based society is, is a postmodern concept. And somewhere it started in the Europe in 60s and 62, so in, in, in 60s. And when we talk about the knowledge, you know, knowledge can be divided into two categories. The one which is a popular knowledge which we, can't, we, we, we understand by the common sense and our everyday understanding of certain things, which we achieve through range of experiences. And the second kind of a knowledge we can call it is an erudite knowledge. So the, when we talk about the knowledge-based society, we are not talking about the popular knowledge, but we are talking about the erudite knowledge, a specialized knowledge, an intellectual rigor, 
that you generally find in the academic institutions, in the research institutions, in law libraries, laboratories, seminars, conferences like this. So friends, when we talk about a knowledge based society, it has major three attributes. And then I'm coming to the law schools. The first attribute of the knowledge based society is creative capacity. Second is innovative talent. And the third is capacity to determine the relevance. Now here, the creative capacity is demonstrated through the generation of new knowledge and dissemination of the new knowledge. When we talk about the innovative talent, which has been demonstrated through the improvisation in the existing product and the services, and when we talk about the capacity, so it is the responsibility of the whole education ecosystem to determine that how we are going to use the creative capacity and innovative talent in order to establish a knowledge-based society. Now, when it comes to the knowledge-based society, it is imperative that we go on convergence of knowledge. And at this juncture, I would like to you guys to ponder upon that friends, when we talk about the national law schools, with all due respect to all the great vice chancellors, we have the Padma Shri, Professor Manon, Professor Venkata Rao, Professor Panda, Professor MP Singh. They are a unitary discipline. Convergence of knowledge, interdisciplinary, is going to be the new era of our understanding. Unless and until we, we have a convergence of knowledge, we interact with the other disciplines, with the disciplines of science, technology, humanities, probably we are not being able to develop the holistic understanding. So when we talk about the law schools and its role, law is omnipotent. And that's the reason that there are a lot of courses that we are offering in the law school. It's not required only you study political science, sociology, economics. You have to go through a wide range of courses. But at the same point in time, I do not say that convergence of knowledge comes at the cost of despecialization. But having been there in specialized field, how we converse with a different discipline. And then we'll be able to produ I mean, we'll be able to establish a knowledge-based society. The knowledge-based society like India, which is an emerging knowledge-based society, because we are striving, we are, we are, we are trying our level, level best to create an innovative solutions for the better uh, problems that the society at large is facing today. Now, when we come to the role of law schools and conversions, you know, what I feel that we, you know, Professor Brandi Singh talked about the AI. I feel that we really need a, a great amount of disruption, the way in which we are perceiving the legal education in this country. Now, when I, when I say disruption, I put forth some of the radical thoughts before all of you. You can think over it, you can ponder upon it and then we can discuss it further. We discussed about the role of Bar Council of India and certain set of mandatory courses. Can we create a kind of a curriculum wherein the students in the first year are being, because when we talk about the knowledge-based society, it's so important. The first primary element to create a knowledge-based society is that a concern the, the, the stakeholders of the higher education institution should have a basic understanding of socio, political, cultural, geopolitical, political understanding of the own country. Can we have, can we develop a curriculum wherein the students can through the basic understanding through variety of courses in the first year? And then we send them to the field. Because what happens is we had a choice-based credit uh, uh, an experiment of choice-based credit system, and we also have in our university, when we give this range of courses, elective courses to them, they are clueless. And then they go to the professor. What should I do? How should I go about it? What combinations? Because they are clueless. Then we said, what is your career aspiration? What are you going to do? We do I don't know, you know, I, let me see how it goes. So students are clueless. So instead of sending the students in the fourth and the fifth year in the field, you know, can we send them to the second year itself and ask them to explore the world, explore the world in a sense, they explore the world of the legal world. They need to work with 
the kind of an institutions they are they, they, they want to work with for a, for a period of one year I'm saying and then they come back and then they then they decide what are the things they really like because you know when we have we discussed the 1400 and 1500 law schools in this country without having any specific program outcome without having any specific program education objectives we say that today the law graduates can do multiple things they can be the lawyers litigators judges stakeholders policy makers lobbies and students are clueless can we create a kind of an ecosystem wherein the certain i know let the law schools decide through their vision statement through their pro program education objectives so this is the law school wherein we are producing good lawyers. And you know, my curriculum, my pedagogy, my whole approach is being in tune with that. Can we have a law school wherein that I am here to create a policy, to produce policy makers? Our focus is on the policy making. And those students who are interested after completion of the second year in their um, field, because they will perceive how the work goes. Otherwise, you know, un I mean, many a times we have, seen, we have seen that even after completion of the graduation degree, they really don't know. You ask them, what are you going to do? Let me see, uh, I may practice, let me try for judiciary, let me try for civil service examination. You know, they are, they are clueless. They are trying at multiple levels because they have not seen the world. They, they have not seen, this is a one month internship, you know, probably some of you, some of us may be going the one, one, two month internship is not adequate to understand the real uh, working world. And then, you know, with specific objectives in the mind, can we, so that, you know, there will be less competition also. There is an increase in competition among the law schools. Professor Santa Kumar has talked about, you know, 70% of the professional education in this country is in the hands of the private players. And there is an inherent competition among the law schools also. And students are clueless and we have all different kind of a gamut to attract the students that you all know very well. So instead of that, I may focus on multiple things. Can can I focus, can a law school focus on one particular thing and let the student decide? Second aspect is, you know, when we talk about the next generation lawyers and the, you know, emerging knowledge society, you know, if you look at this thing for the last 20 years, we have given, you know, individual autonomy has gained its prominence, you know. You look at, you know, your own bedroom, like, your own TV, like, your own mobile phone, like, we all, you know, all, you know, customized medicines, customized wedding, so customization. So we all are different individuals. We have our own uniqueness. We have a different potentials. Can any law school offer me the kind of a courses which suits to my test, which is to, can offer a pedagogy which suits to my learning style? So my point over here is that instead of, you know, we, we, we see that, you know, because Generally, the teachers in the law schools teach the way in which their teachers have taught them. You know, they have a great influence of their teachers in their mind, largely. So instead of having a uniform approach, unified approach of teaching pedagogy, can we have some kind of a customized assessment, customized pedagogy, and instead of teaching them, you know, we have been talking a lot about engaging, but there is no engagement that you know it better. And there is only bombarding of the lectures in the classroom. You know, recently I've been visited some of the universities in Australia, and I'm astonished to see there is one law school, that in the Newcastle University Law School. They have 1,500 students, and they have only one lecture classroom of these setup. The rest of the classrooms are in the small group table, you know, and they are in, all engaging, they are discussing, because if you look at the world tomorrow, where is going, the world is collaboration, the world is where the collaboration is lies, the world is where the adaptability is lies. So these are the few things, adaptability, collaborations, creativity, critical thinking, they cannot be developed through this kind of a setup of the classroom. Uh, you know, I, I end my lecture and you ask you questions and I respond, that's not an engagement. Engage, we need to re revamp and reinvent the pedagogy for today's learners. And then only, and when we talk about, um, I'll just take two minutes more. When we talk about the knowledge-based society and the role of law school, my emphasis is more on the problem-based learning. In the morning session, someone was telling that, you know, the research, you know, the kind of uh, all traditional research is, is going on. But, you know, we have not, we have not 
taught the students how to identify the problem. Identification of a problem will only happen when you experience the world, when you know the world, and then you come with the problem, this is the problem that I'm going to confront, and this, this is, these are the issues. So can we have some kind of a problem solving uh, discussions forums, you know, deliberations forum, wherein we, we discuss range of problems the society is facing. Can we have some kind of a problem solving centers? And then from there, the, you know, the research comes from initial discussions. So problem solving approach is something which we need to gear it up for, uh, for the creating of a knowledge based society and when it comes to the role of law school intervention comes. And the second and the last point which I wanted to bring forth over here is that, that when we talk about, uh, you know, knowledge-based society, one of the most important pillar, you know, that what the UNESCO in its report has uh, pointed out, that in order to, there are four principles of development of equitable knowledge society, and the first and the foremost is cultural diversity, equal access to education. You know, Professor Murthy in the morning said that equity, accessibility, and quality are the three pillars of the higher education. How, and that is what the knowledge-based society is also talk, talking about, how we are going to create this kind of a phenomena that's a, that's a greater challenge uh, that uh, we are going to f uh, face. And lastly, what uh, I would like to focus upon, that uh, when we talk about uh, the engagement of the law students in the classroom, you know, we all agree, students do not learn within the four walls of the classroom. They learn much more outside the classroom. Can we have a different kind of program? You know, I've seen the law on a beach, the law on a roadside. Can we have a different kind of a capsules, modules, wherein law can be really experienced, realized, and then understood? You know, what the particular author has said and what my teachers said from the experience, that experience, I may not be so much sensitized to the experience unless and until I go through that. So my point over here is that we need to gear it up for the problem-based approach and uh, experiential learning education in order to uh, create a larger role of law schools in the uh, knowledge-based society. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. Thank you so much, Professor Purvi. I'm extremely sorry for, you know, timing all your addresses, but my hands are tied, and we have to finish by 1.30. But uh, undoubtedly, you gave a very uh, informative talk, and I would like to comment on one or two points. One is about the choice-based credit system. When I was the dean at the Faculty of Law, Jamia, I also introduced this because there was a UGC circular, and we had to do it. You know, the other students from other disciplines like economics, sociology in Jamia, like we have honors in those disciplines, they came and uh, they took up the subjects. We had introduced forensic sciences, we had introduced uh, specialized contracts. But here, what I would like to share with you is that these all, you know, law is technical. So for a non-law student, it becomes very difficult to put in the same kind of syllabus. So we need to change the syllabus and make it more student friendly who is not a law student. That we have to keep in mind. And I believe now Jami is also offering in-house students to take up these subjects because it's got less options which they offer to students. And another thing is integrating with other disciplines. Yes, that is very important. We integrate it with medicine, engineering, tech technology, and other areas also. Um, I would now like to invite Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, Dean School of Bennett University, Greater Noida, for his address. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you, distinguished panelists and distinguished audience. Morning, it was said, uh, star lawyers and starving lawyers, star schools and starving schools. I also thought there are star speakers and starving speakers. <laughs> because uh, one resolution we need to pass is that Professor Menon will speak only in valedictory. He will never be speaking in the inaugural. For the simple reason, 
even though it's a generic topic, he has covered so much, it became very difficult for me to, you know, again repeat, which has been done more effectively by him, and uh, which possesses the authority and experience. But nevertheless, I thought uh, some few points, uh, which uh, for paucity of time he did not touch, or is part of the larger inaugural he didn't touch, I thought I'll do. To start with, uh, Clarence Darrow once said, the problem with law is lawyers. The problem with law is lawyers. Then I need to extend that. Then if there are problems with lawyers, then the problem is with the law schools, right? That should be the logical progress when you say the problem with law is lawyers, then problem with lawyers is legal education. As uh, that's what I said, in his opening very point, Professor Menon said, it is not some isolation legal education we are talking, it's part of higher education. It's part of education itself. If I try to connect that about the topic we have in this panel about knowledge, then it's also an abstraction. When you talk about knowledge, ask an IIT guy how is now today, he says it's a knowledge society. It's a knowledge society because the kind of speed with which technology has brought unbelievable changes in the last 40, 50 years, I don't think so anybody has a, any technologist is scribbling about knowledge. So it's a technologist's perspective. But it's the same perspective for lawyer about knowledge. Or what lawyer looks, or legal education itself has to look as knowledge, that's very important. If I look at the dictionary meaning, it says awareness, understanding, information, experience, study, possessed by somebody and passed on to somebody. Now, that is the biggest problem. In one sense, from a technology point of view, knowledge, we are really talking quote unquote, which doesn't deal with human beings. It deals with a lot of inanimate things around you. And obviously, the excitement is there. So, if why is a crucial question for a scientist, how is a crucial question for a technologist? For whom is the question for a person in law? For whom? It is not about the, you know, why and how business is done by others, whereas for whom? Which means when I say whom, if I say WTO, if I say a global treaty, my question from this particular space will be, whom does it benefit? Whom does it benefit? Because I cannot talk about an universalization as it's very much easily possible in technology, as it is possible in science. We are talking about law. We are really not the technical part. See, we are all now having legal softwares, all that. But at the end of the day, what is all this legal software? We are going back to the same question about this question of knowledge from what is to be their part of a law school or a legal education or for the lawyers. That is a crucial question. So I thought, uh, as I said, in Western philosophy, truth and falsity falsity or the usually subscribed to statements, propositions or beliefs. Whereas in Indian tradition, if you look at it, truth and falsity are ascribed to a cognition and awareness, which they call jnana. But there is a relatively different synonyms like vijnana, buddhi, sitta, many things in Sanskrit, right? And only equal and some level in Tamil, which I am coming from that part, comes in Thiruvalluvar Sirkuran, which has one ten, you know, ten couplets. You know, a couplet is seven words. He runs a ten couplet, which talks about knowledge as one, which you cannot just like that take it from someone. You need to analyze yourself and come to something which is knowledge or not. So it's not the question of traditional knowledge we call. It's tradition-wise given. But often the depth of this jurisprudence is that, are you analyzing and finding out what it is? This seems to be the fundamental, in my opinion, in the whole fraternity of law, whether it's judge, whether it's lawyer, whether it's a law teacher, whether it's a law student. So it's a very large canvas, and it's a diverse canvas, it's a complex canvas, compared to much linear canvas in terms of science and technology, which I consider as two other things, and management is just an offshoot of that, how to manage science and technology. Whereas I talk law in, in, in these terms, this is very, very crucial because, as I said, 15, 20 years back, what was science? I discard. It's not in my library anymore. It's passe because that is over. That's, that particular programming is over. I move to the new programming, over. 
It's archaeology museum, but not law. I go back. I go back to something and then try to again analyze the whole thing. So it is in this context, I thought uh, the best thing instead of me telling about um, one article which I read, I thought I'll take some extracts to talk to you, is about, uh, about a professor called Diego Martin. He is from Carlos III University of Madrid. If it is very relevant, what he says is simple. He talks about a Castilian proverb, a lawyer without signs, a lawyer without signs or without conscience deserves a severe sentence and penance. Two different things we are talking, signs and conscience. In his analysis, he says, every medieval reign or nation in Europe developed its own law and its own lawyers. Given that only possibly, possible law to study and practice was the Roman law, the task of the jurist was to learn Roman law texts and how to interpret them. The judicial aim was to practice justice, which for some centuries was different from law, an instrument which is to organize legitimate royal or imperial power. In general, the mission of the judge was to seek a fair solution to a specific problem. Sometimes the answer was found in the scarce legal provisions enacted by the prince or the civil magistrate or in the arbitrary decisions taken by the feudal master. With the enactment of the civil code, he says, administration of justice was conducted according accordance to the law and justice and law were assumed to be the same in an attempt to guarantee certain new legal system. It was the beginning of the law's empire or to use Dwarkin's expression, he says, the most important consequence of this change was the complete submission of legal professionals to the legal text. As Montesquieu noted, the judge would be merely the mouth that pronounced the word of the law. It was the destiny of judges. What about lawyers and other legal professionals? If it is the destiny of judges, can you imagine lawyers and lawyers? Because of this historical and political evolution, Respecting the role and the concept of law, old law faculties did little to change. They shifted their prior method of memorizing Roman law or royal acts to the new method of memorizing new national courts and substantive law and constitution. They say that is that, that is that the period? After that, nothing to analyze. If you're really talking about knowledge, can you question the constitution? That is very important. Can, the judges, the lawyers, or the teachers, or the students. This is a very crucial part if I try to talk about the word knowledge, which is not a fixed sum, which is not something passed on, which is not something to be adored and admired, but rather it is a process where you try to do. So a crucial part is what often use the more familiar term, critical thinking. Critical thinking is what we use. So if I talk about critical thinking a few minutes before uh, the chairperson sends me a slip, is I'm coming to law school now. Inside the law school, if I quote, there was a Magna Carta of European universities which are signed in Bologna in September 1988. What did they say? Four fundamental principles. The university is an autonomous institution at the heart of societies differently organized because of geography and historical heritage. It produces, examines, appraises, hands down culture by research and teaching. To meet the needs of the world around it, research and teaching must be morally and intellectually independent of all political authority and economic power. This is, I am talking, the old thing they are bringing back in 1988. Second, they passed a resolution. Teaching and research in the university must be inseparable if their intent is not to lag behind changing needs, demands of the society, and advances of other knowledges. That is, I think, the earlier speakers I said, point, gave these references quite often. Third is, freedom in research and training is a fundamental principle of university life, Go the, and governments and universities, each as far as they are capable, must ensure respect of this fundamental requirement. Rejecting intolerance and always open to dialogue, the university is an ideal meeting ground for teachers capable of imparting their knowledge. This is a third one which they emphasize. Fourth one, a university is a trustee of a humanist tradition. Thank you. It's a constant care to attain universal knowledge. 
to fulfill its vocation, it transcends geographical and political frontiers. This is the fourth one. I think, you know, we need to introspect in terms of knowledge when I say university, as we say many times, that we are uh, industry ready. We are, you know what you call as profession ready. See, I don't want to eulogize legal profession itself. That professionally ready, industrially ready is, in my opinion, we are not talking knowledge from the university point of view. You can be knowledgeable and be industry ready. You have to be knowledgeable and be professionally ready, but you cannot tell that, you know, I am here, a kind of a thing which I am preparing and sending you out because this is a very typical problem which I consider of post-industrialization. So post-industrialization talks about winners. Post-industrialization talks about competition at any cost. Post-industrialization is talking about a knowledge society which is not for the majority, in my opinion. So who does this mantle falls on? In my opinion, among all the other professions, it is the legal education profession, which has, nobody says that don't be industry ready. Nobody says that, you know, deal with technology. But how do I deal with technology? How do I deal with artificial intelligence without understanding labor displacement? Without understanding many of these things which originally were fought many a times, thanks to law and thanks to this legal education, a lot of gains which has been reached, you really find today is among the competing nations, what is your, because nation after nation is bringing educational policy. If you look at the educational policy is the GDP, where you are competing, or this is doing, China is doing, Korea is doing. This seems to be the thing which is a very worrisome uh, trend which you find if in a larger analysis. As I said that, there is one thing which I wanted to close. There is a Dutch saying, we betal bepaald. We betal bepaald means simply translated, as you said, not so rhyming as in Dutch. In English, the one who pays is the one who decides. The one who pays is the one who decides. This I want to leave it a very philosophical query with the shrinking thing of so-called universities and it's an important part of nation states which even kings and uh, princes promoted those days. You have a simply one, one phenomena, fend off yourself. Fend off yourself. Who pays will do means, then who pays you will set your curriculum. Who pays you will set you, what is your professionalism? Who pays you will set a set of knowledge or a part of the knowledge, not knowledge in the holistic way what we saw, not knowledge which we dare to question many times from Socratic times to now. This will be a very, very thing. This is a very worrisome factor, not uh, for our star speakers who have done their work and they still are active, not even I am slightly moving towards retirement and it is the worry which many of the young thinkers here others have to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vivekanandan, for a very, very knowledgeable address. I think we'll take this point up later. We have very little time left now. I request Professor Bhavani Prasad Panda to please come forward and deliver his address. My salute to Professor Minan, my teacher, Professor Venkatra, Professor M.P. Singh, co-panelists, dear friends. Well, uh, Professor Vivekanandan spoke about the problem of uh, law is advocates. I say a little more different. Uh, it's not law uh, advocates, but it's law teachers. I'm also part of it. Uh, these are the days of post modernism where a lot of deconstruction should happen. These are the days of uh, technology, machine learning, deep learning, super specialization, and destructive knowledge, technology. Now, in these particular days, what are we supposed to do? We are not understanding the 21st century children, new millennium children what they really want in the classroom. However wonderful teacher I may be, I go to the class, I adjust everything within 15 minutes. Are the students, though if I have the material also, the students don't have the presence of listening to me because they have wonderful gadgets in their hands. That occupies them, that distracts them, that puts them in different molds. This is a fact. And how to contain these particular children 
We never think, we never, never understand them. And we think that we have wonderful knowledge. I have done preparation for three days. I'm going to just give to the students and the students will be learning these things. No, they're not interested. They want everything ready-made, quick, clean, and according to their needs. And it's not going to happen that way. But still, the teacher of the modern, modern day teacher doesn't understand what it is. Uh, understanding this particular modern or new millennium children, I have started thinking what should be the teacher. I will tell what should be the teacher, then probably you will be able to relate what ails the education. The future teacher, legal law education, legal education, he should be freelance. Why does somebody should hire me? I should choose where I should be hired. And I'll enter into contracts. Why does I should be associated with only one global general or three law university, three national law university? Maybe I'll choose in a year two, three law universities, two months assignment, design a course, a unique course, offer it for a contract period, complete the course, come back. And I enjoy another six months for preparing the module and syllabus and research. This is all free, this is possible. And I will charge the money, what is necessary for the whole of annum. Within six months teaching, I will earn the whole of the money for the year. Six months I'll have to put up for research. And I'm a freelance teacher. If you are in university, not interested, I'll go to some other university. The wonderful 25 law universities and equally wonderful universities like Global Jindal are there. If I'm ready to offer, if I have some substance, you're going to hire me. And I look to that particular type of, and the students know pretty well, within two months, this course is going to be over. How oh, I should be assessed. And there's no question of semester long course, one by one, it has to happen. In other words, with a limited time, a super license has to happen. And I know what timing I'll be teaching and how I'll be doing. And it's uh, preparing a syllabus course curriculum is not a one day, two day, one week, one, 10 days, 15 days, one month exercise. It's a total reset of six months to prepare a course curriculum, to prepare a wonderful study material and reading material. And the reading material should be as brief as possible and should go deep into the learning process. And this learning process, I have to prepare what questionnaire, what models, what pedagogy. It requires a lot of research. Six months I require for preparing one course. The same course again, I'll be revising, revising. So I am dreaming of a freelance teacher. A teacher, not a slave of any institution, not a paid servant to anybody, is a professional. Maybe I go to the court and practice also. I understand the field dynamics. Professor Meenan has been very seriously saying, speaking about clinical type of learning. And clinical courses should increase. Bar Council is only offering four. We should think of 10, 12. I said, why 10, 12? It can be an empty number of. Because I don't, we have, we have diverse from what medical pattern of legal education is. Medical education is a professional course. But our courts are very far away from us. From Sonipat, you go to the court, whole of the day is lost. And how are we going to learn things? So maybe an advocate, with six months of preparation, he comes over there. Why tell the particular conundrum whether the law teacher should be allowed to practice? Yes, who are you to tell me where I have to practice? I'm a freelance, I contract and I teach and I go and practice, I come back. So this is a teacher I'm looking into. And this type of teachers are available in plenty in Bombay. They're advocates, they come and they teach and they go away. And I don't mind hiring the young graduates, young minds, provided you fall into this particular group. Either these are the days of market, market-driven institutions and you offer a course, prepare a syllabus, offer to the institution, it can be done. And maybe as a teacher, out of the 60 courses, I'll make 240 courses. Out of the 60 courses, I'll make each particular course four modules. And each module I'll be offering for a teacher separately. So, umpteen number, money is not a problem. Sufficient money is available, and it can be done. So this is what my simple submission. I say, a teacher has a lot of work. He has the research, he has the publication, necessity, he has field understanding, he has a need to also understand the institution, very easily. So for deep learning and this particular machine learning, this is the methods. So this is what law teachers will do. Uh, are, uh, today the law teachers are in really in chaos. The nation needs more number of law teachers. It's not happening. So with this particular one message, 
I know my time is running out, and uh, I try to not take any messages from my chairperson, and I conclude over here. Thank you very much. Thanks to the last two for giving me wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much, Professor Bhavani Prasad Panda. And you were really <laughs> within the time. And uh, you made some very important points regarding you know, the role to be played by a law teacher. I think uh, a law teacher has to give a lot. And it's not just classroom teaching. It is outside. It is research. It is interaction with a student. It is counseling a student. And the sooner we realize, the better. Because the faculty that we have in uh, most of the law schools it's really not coming up to the expectations. Now I um, invite questions from the house. I think we'd be very, yes, we have time for that. How much? 10 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, we are ready to answer. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so uh, my question is very generic. I wanted to know how can law schools bridge the widening gap between disseminating traditional knowledge and uh, market-based market knowledge, which is now the need of the hour? Yes, the question is not actually traditional market lawyers. Traditional market and new market. See, there's no traditional lawyers. That was a traditional market, which was done from the family side. Now you've got a new market. One way new market is more democratic. It, uh, you know, gets out of this exclusive club. Right. Another way is that traditional market adds certain level of ethics and certain things. So, as you said that... Uh, as economies and other things and population, so many things. The way out will be the, what you call the new market lawyers. As you said, 50, 100, 200, 300, etc. The problem of the new market is also, as Professor Venkatrao pointed out, that uh, there are just uh, 50 firms which run United States. So sooner or later, uh, you will also have some 50 firms running 1.3 billion population. So this is where, again, the whole knowledge of law school, legal education has to look at ownership and, you know, competition and, you know, whether is it a, a kind of a monopoly, which these are things. Awesome. Okay. Uh, any other question? Yes. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes. So my question is, uh, do the law colleges train law students as professional lawyers or rather professionals? Because setting up your practice, managing underlings, clients, and uh, taking example of criminal law, the art of cross-examination, which is a critical aspect for uh, criminal litigation, it's never been taught in any law school for that matter. So, um, so the, do the law colleges train law students professional as professionals? And um, uh, there's also a second question. Uh, can a lawyer educated in a law college with minimum infrastructural facility, inadequate teaching, Star, uh, inadequate teaching staff stand as a professional upholding high standards of legal profession. Thank you. Would you like to answer this question right away? Anybody? Yes? Yeah. I think uh, quite a few number of law schools may be imparting this kind of a, a training. And uh, what I feel, I mean, I would like to answer your second question, the first that even inadequate infrastructure, inadequate staff, faculty, doesn't make any difference if you are motivated, if you are committed to work hard, if your vision is very clear, you know, no one can stop you to succeed. You know, we have seen, you know, all the great judges which this country has produced, they were not from the national law schools. They all were from the traditional law schools wherein they were, they were not having this great infrastructure. So, you know, what I feel that, you know, infrastructure teaches, you know, we have the example of Ekulavya. 
you know one one has to be ekalavya one has to have that kind of a, uh, you know spirit of uh, commitment for to pursue the goals and aspirations you can do that and if there are not many number of law schools offering the kind of a training which you ask for some of them have started other will try definitely will follow them that's what my uh, um, apprehension is what i would like to say here is that we should integrate you know when you talk about cross examination etc i think we should have more advocates who could be called and we could have uh, sessions by them this is called what we would say in uh, you know uh, societies like america etc it's experiential learning you know which you learn by putting litigation into simple subjects like contract tort property or uh, criminal law also so that you understand what is happening in the field and regarding the infrastructure i feel yes having a good faculty is important having a motivated faculty is important because only then students would like to attend lectures because wherever i've been if the faculty is good the students will come the students will come the faculties have to inspire and have to really work hard automatically they'll come i mean i'm from delhi university i remember professor madhav menon's professor bakshi's professor ap singh's professor bb pandey's classes by god students used to stand at the door and listen okay that is what we call you know that you make your classes interesting so that the students would automatically come thank you yeah any other question i have i have one right here yeah so uh, good afternoon everyone so in how is the uh how are the practitioners working with the law schools to sort of close that gap so you do have more opportunities as a student to um access that experiential learning component that doesn't seem to be present now mm -hmm. uh would you like to answer okay see this uh, again the word professional we are using uh, teachers are also professionals teachers also is also part of the profession when you teach theory what we are talking is theory and practice what you learn in a medical school and then when you practice as a doctor so can everything is taught in the medical school there is a theory and there when you know one year internship where they do intensively about something that doesn't make a doctor a professional you know you don't go to a doctor who just had one year internship can you operate me so the word profession is something which you learn on the way the theory and practice as you will agree that there has to be more interaction of certain aspects we don't expect what is happening in the court a teacher to teach if we can do that you would have resigned and made more money there so the point what i am trying to tell you is there has to be there but the question again begs one thing you don't fit theory to the practice you need to imaginatively understand practice if i'm going to take practice as the one which i'm going to teach god save society thank you any more questions good afternoon um over here yeah yes could you speak loudly please okay. uh, good afternoon my question is that in the present times we can see that students in um, national law schools are more corporate sector oriented so mm. what can be the mechanisms that we can develop at the level of imparting education so that they can be more so that we can inculcate a bent of mind towards research in the field of academics uh anybody one of you would like to answer otherwise okay i will pick up this one i think we should not do anything as of now we should leave it to the students like if they would want to get into litigation they would not have come to your masters doing a specialization in corporate law and if they want to work for a law firm they will obviously look for it and there are people even in the third year they start preparing for judiciary service judicial service civil services i think the law school should not uh, you know try to convince individuals in taking everybody to litigation law school prepares you to be a legal professional and whatever may be your career option you should be allowed to pursue and the law school should facilitate that whatever may be your choice i think we should not uh, take anything more to force people to get into litigation on that note i would like to just add one more thing that uh, the number of students who are pass outs of nash uh, sorry uh, central universities are supposed to be more who are uh, performing well in the um, uh, uh, all india public service examinations. examinations that's right yeah and uh, mostly the reason which i have observed is that the 
that the curriculum that they are exposed to um, in somewhat ways uh, make them more efficient in uh, performing well. So I think that balance is to also uh, uh, needs to be maintained at the level of national schools because the ultimate goal is to impart knowledge which is certainly skill oriented, but it should cater the needs to the, both the sections of the um, um, society. I think he yeah. See, these are all some of the minor. I remember Professor Menon will know one of our early batch, first batch, second batch person, you know, got into television. You know, he was into television business. There are a few, a lot of doctors who get to public service. But overall number, when you look, this is very minuscule thing of, you know, going that. And there also, their original skill sets helps them a lot. I had a person in Waipo, Geneva, in permanent mission, foreign embassy. He used to come and sit with me in negotiations. He's a, basically a forensic doctor. He's a forensic doctor, but the way he was analyzing, he brings in a lot of his forensic understanding in public policy areas. So these, sometimes these skill sets will help, but they are very minor. And as far as the first question which Professor Shantakumar answered to you, as you said, the, the law schools were cre originally pushed because this will come to litigation, but it did not happen, as Professor Venkatra said, when originally it came, there was no globalization. Later on, globalization came, it's speaking up. When it's speaking up, it's a fundamental freedom of choice what they go. Probably little clogging in the corporate, they may come to litigation. But we have observed over a period of time, lawyers are never there in one particular thing. You, they go for five, six years, and then they've come back as NGOs. They've come back to certain academy I'm back because they feel that, you know, what you call us, they're reaching a saturated point. But I, I, as you said that uh, uh, there is no way, uh, what you call us, uh, uh, beyond sensitization, we cannot tell that, you know, which one to choose because I think uh, they're smart and they know what they want and uh, what is uh, their preferences. So you cannot help because the market is so much. That's what Professor Menon said. Market is there and that is offering. That becomes, so the, unless one is highly committed to academics, which will be definitely lower than any other, other things, or to any other civil service, because I've seen, I've seen a string of very bright people who got a corporate thing, uh, come back to public policy institutes. They come back to public policy institutes, and interestingly, in Nalsar, many people were applying to international relations and governance in US schools, which is not law. They wanted a broader outlook. So uh, we have to wait and see how this stabilizes. Say a few words on this uh, point where you say that mostly students go to the corporate sector. It's true, you know, but I feel that uh, students should also become litigating lawyers because that is very important. If you just cater to the corporate sector, it's like getting a pay package and you're happy, but you're not having exposure to the courts, you're not helping to develop directly to the law, because what do lawyers do? Lawyers argue in courts, and judges also get information from lawyers to pave or even new paths to interpret law in a particular manner. So for the growth and development of law and for lawyers as such, I think litigation is a good option. I remember Justice Sikri, you know, who once said in a seminar that more and more lawyers should, uh, students should come into litigation, into practicing lawyers, because that gives you more gratification. You'll win a case and you'll learn more. So it's not only corporate sector, it is practice, and it's also civil services now. You know, being in Jamia, I've seen many of our students enter the judicial services. You know, it's the law judiciary. But I feel that also, they should set highest targets for themselves. Uh, being in the law judiciary is not enough for life. You have to do something higher, much more. So set higher targets for yourself, you'll achieve them. Thank you. And research cell, we need to work hard on that, all law schools. Any other question, please? I actually have a question. We have just two minutes more. Yes. Um, now that you're all esteemed deans of very privileged colleges, um, there is a, th a thinking in a student's mind who want to go into the academics, that I'll have to do an LLM, I'll have to clear the NET, no matter how much we're saying that it's not important, but we'll have to, and then get a PhD. And when I get a PhD, I will come into academics. Um, that is also what my, I'm, I'm a litigating lawyer, I've been practicing, but I want to come into academics. And this is, I've tried to carve my path through LLM and PhD. But is there any other way that if I don't want to do my NET or PhD, I will still get a job at probably your universities or probably mine university or some other university that thinks that I am capable enough without the NET or PhD that I can take forward my teaching skills because 
I think I have that. So is the criteria most important or is the person's personality or teaching skills is more important? Look, teaching skills are important. We check that in the interview, okay? And uh, since I'm in a private place now, which is affiliated to Guru Gobind Singh IP University, the management there is very particular about communication skills and maybe <coughs> knowledge is tested by people like me and some other lawyer or law teacher. But uh, the eligibility criteria remain the same, okay? But if you've practiced for some years as advocate, we do give an opportunity for you to take classes so that you'll be better at procedural law, which probably we teachers have never had that exposure. You understand? And also this is available even in universities like Delhi, Faculty of Law, Jamia. You know, and that is one of the requirements of the Bar Council also. Because, because what I think is whenever we open, yeah, I'll have Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We'll yes. just, uh, I request uh, Professor Patnayak to please come on the stage and give away the mementos to the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> to the, right. I'm sorry we're short of time today. Thank you, uh, Professor Patnayak. <laughs> 